year was 2010. That volcano that no one could pronounce had just erupted. The movie Inception was taken box office by storm, and Panasonic updated their year-old GF line with the brand new GF2. If you haven't used the GF2 before, one of the first things you might be surprised by is just how small it is. Now, when you see this camera in pictures, it looks like it's about the same size as, say, something from the Sony A6000 line, but in reality, it's a lot closer to a compact camera. Which leads us to our second interesting fact. GF2 is surprisingly heavy. This camera has a decent amount of weight for such a small camera. It's actually really sturdy and really well built. The GF2 also sports a touchscreen, albeit a low-resolution, semi-unresponsive touchscreen. While modern cameras have a touchscreen more like something from a smartphone, the GF2 has a touchscreen kind of like you would find on an ATM. It's more of a soft, spongy kind of you gotta push every button two or three times just to get it to kind of work touchscreen. Maybe not what you're picturing by modern standards. And speaking of standards that aren't quite modern, the GF2 has a 12 megapixel Micro Four Thirds sensor, which even DP Review in their February of 2011 review referred to it as aging. The 12 megapixel sensor isn't modern by any stretch of the imagination, but in terms of a $65 camera, it's pretty decent. It offers both stills and JPEG, and the ability to shoot stills and JPEG simultaneously, so you've got that going for you. Speaking of which, stills from the GF2 actually look pretty good for a 10-year-old camera. In terms of video, the GF2 does 1080i at 60 frames per second from a 30 frames per second capture. It's not quite the same thing as a modern camera doing 60 frames per second because they do it from a 60 frames per second capture. It's complicated, but point being, the image quality is just okay. And with the GF2, we run into one of the same problems that we see with a lot of Panasonic's older enthusiast-level cameras, which is there's absolutely no control over movie mode. Movie mode is 100% automatic. You have no ability to change any of the settings. The only setting you can change in movie mode is just exposure compensation. And along those same lines, another area where the GF2 shows its age is a complete lack of picture profiles. Whereas on older cameras like the G3 or the G5, you could at least adjust the picture profile to change to something that you like a little bit better, even make adjustments to say contrast and saturation and sharpness. On the GF2, you have no access to that whatsoever. You simply get what the camera gives you. And of course, if you're looking at the GF2 for vlogging, autofocus is not the fastest in the world. It's not bad though. I mean, when you're just, when you have the camera at arm's length and you've got face detection on, it does seem to do a pretty decent job of just keeping you in focus. But in terms of B-roll and stuff like that, autofocus is pretty slow, sluggish, and not really accurate. And of course, speaking of vlogging, there is no mic input on the GF2. The GF2 instead has an onboard mic just in between the hot shoe and the shutter button. And you have to be careful because if you're like me, I usually vlog left-handed, and I've noticed oftentimes I put my hand naturally just over the microphone, so I've had to learn to start holding the camera with my right hand so I don't block the mic. Just one of those little things that you have to watch out for with this camera. So with what seems like a lot of strikes against it, the GF2 does have one thing going for it, and that's price. I mean, currently you can find this used on eBay anywhere from $60 to $75. I mean, I kind of think of it as a $65 camera that has access to all of Panasonic, all of Olympus's, and all of Sigma's lenses. That's a pretty big deal for a cheap camera. I guess the question is, is there any point to the GF2 in 2020? As far as I can figure, it makes sense for someone who just wants like a travel camera or just a spare camera that's small and durable, easy to carry around, has okay picture quality and okay video quality, or maybe just ultimately it's for like the collector who simply likes the novelty of buying a 10 year old camera because it only costs $65 at this point. I feel like the GF2 kind of toes the line of being completely irrelevant and easily replaced by a smartphone versus, well, there's the novelty of it only costs $65 and you have access to all of these Micro Four Thirds lenses. Ultimately, the choice is up to you. Only you know if you actually need a 10-year-old camera that costs under $100. 
Anyway, I think that's all I've got for today, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.